Hello and welcome to Mission Church Online. We are so glad that you've taken time to join with us. It's gonna be a great time today. Pastor Richard is coming to continue our series, week three of Grounded in God's Word. We're so grateful about what God is doing through this series in our church and how he's using it. And I know God's gonna bless you today through his word. Hi, I'm Pastor Richard, and it is a delight to be with you today and to share with you in continuation in our series on Grounded in the Word of God. Of all the doctrines connected with the Christian faith, none is more important than the one that has to do with the basis of our religious knowledge. Where do we get our knowledge and on what is our faith base? And of course, for Christians, it always comes back to the Bible. Our church position officially, you can find it on our website, describes the Bible as the 66 books, inspired, infallible, the living word of God. They're without error in the original manuscripts and are the supreme and final authority for one's faith and life. I love that statement. But the issue I wanna deal with today is the question, is our Bible reliable? Is it trustworthy? Let me give you a clear answer to those questions. Yes, and yes, double yes. Today I wanna to share a message of certainty in the midst of uncertainty. I heard a sports radio talk show host just this last week say, an opinion is like a fingerprint. Everybody has one. <laughs> Indeed, everyone does have an opinion. We have opinions about everything. The internet has only amplified the voice digitally. Often strong opinions are shared with regard to the Bible, questioning its claims and seeking to poke holes in its integrity and reliability. Some of you are encountering blogs, websites, chat groups. Perhaps at times you see posts from friends, coworkers, even sadly sometimes former church family members who are questioning the reliability and infallibility of the Bible, or they're flat out refuting it. That can be ominous and discouraging. It's dangerous. Perhaps right now you're struggling with doubts about the Bible. I wanna encourage you today with the truth that we do indeed have a Bible that is reliable. I wanna exhort you today to receive it to trust it, to share it with the world. We must receive and proclaim God's word as inerrant, without error, trustworthy. So why should we receive and proclaim the Bible as inerrant? Let me give you four reasons this morning. Number one, and I think this is what is really on the heart of our pastoral staff, scripture is under attack and we need to defend it. You don't have to read the scriptures very long to encounter Satan's efforts to undermine the truth. Go with me to Genesis chapter three, where we know Satan is known as the father of lies. He's always sought to undermine the truth with deadly errors. And as we see early in the third chapter of the Bible, we see him starting his attack on Eve and on the human race with a question. It's actually an attack on God. God had placed Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden and they were lavished with freedom and surrounded by perfection. They were given one restriction with a promise. Don't eat of one certain tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And it came with this promise, this warning. In the day you partake of it, you will surely die. So we come to Genesis 3 in verse 1. Did God actually say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. <laughs> In essence, folks, what he's saying here is you have a right to question God. And he went on to say, you won't die. God lied. You have a right to question God because, in fact, God lies. You can't trust his word. And, folks, that became the strategy of the enemy of our souls. This danger comes to us not only from outside the church, but sadly, from inside the church, you might remember several months ago, our pastor did a study with us in the book of Jude, where, among other things, we were warned of those who sneak into the church and leave a path of destruction in their wake. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus described these people as wolves in sheep's clothing. They were wolves wearing the false garment of a prophet. Paul, in Acts chapter 20, as he's departing from Ephesus, he warns the Christian leaders there, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you that will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Folks, this is serious. This is what's happening a lot today as we see professing brothers and sisters in Christ drawn away from the truth into the grip of the world and the flesh through questioning and rejecting the veracity of Scripture. In Matthew 18, Jesus uses very strong language in warning people who do this. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is, necess it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one to whom the temptations come. Perhaps there's no greater sin than to, than to question or to refute the veracity of Scripture, to question its inerrancy and its authority. Our burden for you as pastors here at Mission is that you be strong in accepting the Bible as without error, reliable and totally trustworthy, because when the Scripture is under attack, the truth of Christ is under attack. Your faith is under attack. Falsehood that's, that questions and refutes the Bible sabotages the truth. Secondly, we must accept, affirm, and advance an inerrant Bible because Scripture is authoritative, and we must declare it. The basic doctrine is spelled out in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. My dad used to define the word all here. I, it's kind of crude, but I like it. All all means is all. That's all. <laughs> His words still ring in my ears about the complete inspiration of the Bible. We believe in a whole Bible, he used to say. Not a Bible full of holes. Amen? We don't have time today to dive into the depths of the richness of this important truth about inspiration. So much could be said, but I do want to stress here the important connection between inspiration and inerrancy. The fact that the entirety of Scripture is God's breath, breathed out by God, His spoken word, speaks to the very nature and character of our God. Our God is a God who by his very nature acts by speaking. To say of God that he spoke and to say of God that he did something is in fact the very same thing. In the Old Testament, we see this in the creation of the universe. God created by speaking. God said, let there be light, Genesis 1 and verse 3. And there was light. And this pattern continues through all the six days of creation recorded in Genesis 1. 
each act of God, his speaking, followed by simple description, it was so. It's tragically fitting that humanity's fall was partly brought on by language as well. The snake threw God's clear command into confusion by distorting God's words. Did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? And then he explicitly denies the fatal consequence God had declared would follow from that disobedience. God's immediate response to this tragic event was to speak directly himself. For he calls to man, where are you? And then he proceeds to pronounce curses on the serpent, on the woman, and on the ground, and by extension, on the man. You know, it would have been quite possible for God to have simply introduced painful childbearing into the woman's life and to have made the snake crawl in his belly and make man's labor on the land difficult, all without speaking by wordless acts of judgment. But that's not what the God of the Bible did. He is a God who by his very nature acts by speaking. The divine word that created in the first place continues to speak in warning man against disobedience to God and then in uttering curses when disobedience occurs. This pattern continues throughout the Old Testament as God unfolds his redemptive plan, making spoken covenants in Genesis 12 and giving Abraham the words of promise, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In so doing, God commits himself there to a course of faithful action that eventually leads to the birth of the Redeemer Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, the relationship of Christ's words and the action of God are especially important in the salvation of sinners. God declares the sinner to be righteous in his sight. We call this the biblical doctrine of justification, where God literally restores us to a proper relationship with him before any actual change in our spiritual state takes place. Paul put it like this, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. Romans 5.8. God establishes by his own declaration a fundamental change in our standing before him. He declares us righteous. God speaking is an integral part of God acting to save. So in biblical language and theology, God speaking and God acting are often one and the same thing. In Isaiah, the author of scripture calls himself the God of truth. Jeremiah said, the Lord is the true God. In the New Testament, John several times refers to God as true. And we are assured on a number of occasions in the scripture that he, God, cannot lie. The Bible has to be inerrant because it is the word of God. And God is true and cannot lie. The Old Testament writers summed it up. Proverbs 3 and verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. The psalmist said it, the law of the Lord is perfect. But you know, it's true in the New Testament as well. The writers wrote with unshakable conviction that the Old Testament was God's word. They quoted it over 300 times. The apostle Paul told the Roman Christians, for whatever was written in former days, was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The writings of Paul and Peter recognize other portions of the New Testament other than their own words as from God. In one command of Timothy, Paul clearly ascribes divine authority to both the Old and the New Testaments, the words of Jesus. 
The Apostle Peter, interestingly, endorses Paul's writings and equates them with other scriptures. I'm quoting, and count the patience of our Lord Jesus as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, who wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. <laughs> Paul commended the Thessalonian Christians because, verse 13 of chapter 2, it says, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Scripture's own testimony is to its authority. It is authoritative, and we are to declare it. There's a third reason we need to ascribe to, um, an error-free Bible, a faithful, reliable text. Scripture is accurate, and we must demonstrate it. I wish I had a lot more time to develop this, but I'll just sort of fly through a couple things here. What do we have outside the sheer testimony of Scripture itself to show that the veracity of Scripture? Well, archaeology, for many years, people laughed at Bible believers because the Bible referred to places, people, and events that had no basis in recorded history. However, over time, through the grace of God, he has allowed the archaeologist spade, if you will, to uncover many items from the ancient past that have confirmed the factual nature of the Word of God. Not a single piece of evidence has ever surfaced that contradicts the Bible at, only, at any point in its history. About science, others have mocked the Bible and claimed that it is woefully inaccurate in matters of science. However, time was once again vindicated the accuracy of the message of the Bible. A couple of illustrations. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, 22, that the earth is a sphere. Man discovered this in the 15th century. The Bible says the earth is suspended in space, Job 26, 7. Well, Sir Isaac Newton discovered this in 1687. The Bible claims the number of the stars is innumerable, Genesis 15, 5. Abraham probably could only see about 1,200 stars in his day. Now we know there are literally trillions of stars in the heavens. The Bible contains rules regarding medicine and even sanitation. Thousands of years ahead of its time. <laughs> Talks about washing and quarantining, interestingly enough. About history, well, that is evident and fulfilled prophecy for sure. There are literally thousands of prophetic predictions made in the Bible. Some of these prophecies are quite dramatic in nature. Not a single prophecy made in the Bible has ever failed and never will fail or never fail to come to pass. Some of the most remarkable prophecies are those related to the Lord Jesus Christ. For instance, if you were to take just a few of the most specific prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus and his birth and his earthly life, you can see how astonishing the accuracy of the Bible truly is. There are about 16 or 17 that I could give you quickly here. He was born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. He was preceded by a forerunner in Isaiah 43. That's, of course, John the Baptist. He would enter Jerusalem on a colt. Zechariah 9 9. He'd be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41 9. His hands and his feet would be pierced. Psalm 22 16. He would be wounded by his enemies. Isaiah 53 5. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11 12. He would be spat upon and beaten. Isaiah 50 and verse 6. The betrayal money would be cast in, down into the temple and 
would be used to buy a potter's field, Zechariah eleven thirteen. He would be silent before his accusers, Isaiah 53, 7. He would be crucified with thieves. People would gamble for his garments. His side would be pierced. Not a bone in his body would be broken. His body would not decay. He would be buried in the tomb of a rich man. And ultimately, darkness would cover the earth. Someone has calculated that the odds of just these 17 prophecies coming to pass is one in 480 billion times, one billion times, one trillion. That is 480 followed by 30 zeros. That is awesome. And then there's the issue of unity. What God began in Genesis, he ended in Revelation. Over 1,500 years and 40 different authors in writing the Bible, and yet it unfolds perfectly into one story from beginning to end that could never be duplicated by any human work. Friend, the Bible can be trusted. Honesty is another issue. You ever thought about it? If this were merely a human book, it would gloss over the failures of the people found within its pages, for sure. However, the Bible doesn't do that. It doesn't hide Noah's drunkenness or Samson's lust or David's adultery or Elijah's depression or Peter's denial. It tells the truth from cover to cover. The Bible can be trusted. It's reliable. Scripture's under attack. We must defend it. Scripture is authoritative. We must declare it. Scripture is accurate. We must demonstrate it. And finally, Scripture is active. Active through the power of the Spirit. And we must deploy it. We have a great commission. And the Bible is the power of God to save sinners. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the dunamis, it is the dynamite, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Peter says, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. The power is in the text. The power is in the truth. The power is in the word. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's powerful, more powerful than anything. But we're not only saved by the word, we're strengthened by the word. The Bible is the power of God to strengthen us as believers. And just before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed for us. And he cried out to the Father and he said, My Father, sanctify them. That's us. Through the truth. Your word is truth. The truth of the word of God sanctifies the soul of the believer it, it, it sets the believer apart from sin. It, it, it equips us. It builds us up in him. It edifies us. We're comforted by that truth. I appreciate what one preacher said. There are a lot of books that can change your thinking, but there's only one book that can change your nature and your eternal destiny. That is, that's rich. In evangelism, The Holy Spirit energizes our proclamation of the biblical gospel. The Holy Spirit uses the preaching of the word to pierce our hearts and convict us of our sin. Romans 10 speaks of that. Paul told the Thessalonians, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. What a great verse. Paul explained to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 4, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Friend, no one can be saved from their sin apart from gospel truth. Yes, it's Jesus who saves, but you can't separate Jesus from the Bible. They're inseparable. And there are people out there on the internet trying to do that. Oh, it's not the Bible. It's not the words. It's Jesus. Yes, they're two together. 
It's not the cleverness of the preacher, friend. It's not the skill of the sower. It's the power of the seed and the preparation of the soul that makes a difference. Look at this quote from C.H. Spurgeon, famous 19th century English pastor and prolific author. Many consider him the prince of preachers. He said, unless the Holy Spirit blesses the word, we who preach the gospel are of all men most miserable. We've entered a sphere where nothing but the supernatural will ever avail. If the Holy Spirit doesn't renew the hearts of our hearers, we can't do it. If the Holy Spirit doesn't regenerate or give life, we can't. If he does not send the truth home to our souls, we might as well speak in the ear of a dead corpse. (laughs) The Holy Spirit will not do this transforming work without the word. The Holy Spirit is the omnipotent power behind the Lord's promise in Isaiah 55, 11. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This happens because the word of God is empowered by the Holy Spirit for its own purposes. Friend, it's exciting to see what happens in people's lives. It's it's, it's happening in Mission Church. When the Holy Spirit's power is unleashed with the preaching and teaching of God's Word, the Bible, sinners are being wonderfully delivered from sin and transformed into new creations. Then the process of this changing more and more into the image of Christ, we call it sanctification, begins. Growth in God, growth in Christ, becoming more like Him. There's now a new internal energy for worship, empowerment for service, and an eagerness to learn the Scriptures, to want more of it, to get deeper into it. What a thrill the other night. 27 folks in our our missions course. The place was, the, the lobby was full, and it was exciting to just see them digging deep into the Word. We cannot be faithful proclaimers of the Scripture if we have a weak view of the Bible, since this is the living, abiding Word of God. We must have built into the absolute clarity every word, his word. His word is an errant. It's a, a, a trustworthy word. It's a perfect word. It's a totally reliable word. Yes, everyone has an opinion. Everyone has his or her story. The world clamors for leaders and authorities with definitive answers and solutions to the questions and uncertainties of life. Wow, how we've seen that over the last couple of years during the pandemic. Masks, no masks. Distancing, no distancing. Vaccines, no vaccines. And on and on. A lot of uncertainty. A lot of back and forth. A lot of backpedaling. A lot of experts who don't turn out to be experts. And here we are two years later, people kind of throwing their hands up in the air. I don't know what any of this means uncertainty. Hmm. The Apostle Peter in his last letter in preparing for his imminent death, he's exhorting the Christian brothers whom he loves so dearly to continue to grow in their knowledge of God and in the grace which God gives them to, and be prepared for false prophets and destructive heresies that deny the Lord. He assures them when he leaves, he will not leave them without a navigation system for their lives. We do not live in the darkness of uncertainty. Peter says, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne by him by majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on that holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, 
For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Friend, there's a lot of darkness that surrounds us. There's a lot of uncertainty and doubt. An eyewitness of the glorified and risen Christ Jesus says, we have a prophetic word confirmed, a more sure word of prophecy. It's a light that shines in a dark place. It's the written word of God, which Peter says is not a book of created fables. Peter saw Jesus on that mountain. He heard the voice of God the Father with his own ears. But Peter holds up the word of God and he calls this the prophetic word confirmed. This is God's authoritative word without error and powerful. It is the light in the midst of darkness. It is the character of God revealed in writing. And so I end with this. Peter said, you do well to heed it. Are we heeding it? What does that mean? It means we're taking it in. Are you reading it? It means we're meditating upon it. We're thinking through it. Are we doing that? And then we submit to it. We say, yes, Lord, your will revealed in this book be done in my life to your glory. That's what he's called us to do. It's one thing to believe in an infallible, inerrant, powerful book, the Word of God, His Word. He wants us to carry it out to His glory in our lives. May God help us to do just that.
That was a great message and an amazing reminder of the power of God's word that it is never going to fail, that it stands the test of time and that it is without error and we can build our lives upon a strong foundation that never changes. We're so encouraged by that and so blessed. Thank you, Pastor Richard. And I wanna just give a couple of reminders today. I wanna encourage you, we value community at Mission Church and that's why we wanna get to know you. Please don't be a stranger behind the camera that we never get to connect with. Please fill out a connection card and let us know you're watching. Please uh, touch base with us via direct message or chat or email or whatever form, but we would just love to build a relationship with you. We'd be able to love to be able to pray for you and encourage you. If you have a prayer request, you can put that on the connection card wherever you're watching. And, and myself and our staff team pray over those each week and would love to pray and be a part of your life. Also, I wanna challenge you to be part of community in a small group. We have groups that are meeting every night of the week and we just started this week. It's not too late to get involved in a small group. So sign up today and be part of something that God can use other people to sharpen and, and challenge you and encourage you along the way in this life. We all need people. We all need uh, each other in this world. And so I pray that, that you could be part of life-changing community and relationships. If you wanna see a list of groups and get signed up, there's a link wherever you're watching, click on small groups and we would love to get you plugged in and connected where you can build that life-changing community. Finally, I wanna say a special word of thanks to everyone who financially gives to support the ministry of Mission Church. Did you know that when you give at Mission Church, you support our missionaries all around the world? That every single month we are supporting missionaries uh, all over the world who share the message of Jesus. And it's amazing because in that way, the ministry of Mission Church never stops. It never sleeps, right? There's always someone who is carrying on the work and the ministry through the church. And we're so blessed and grateful for that. We're so thankful for your partnership. Not only does that impact people around the world, but right here in Goodyear, we're able to produce these online services and minister to so many people because of your generosity and your faithfulness. Thank you so much for partnering with us in the ministry of the gospel. God bless you. Thank you for watching. We hope you have an amazing week and remember you are loved.